Well, welcome everyone to the Interagency Modeling and Analysis Group Multiscale Modeling Consortium webinar. Um, today we're having a, a webinar by Dr. Patty Brennan, who is the Director of the National Library of Medicine. Um, Patty came and spoke to our 10th Anniversary Multiscale Modeling Consortium meeting in March of this year, and we were delighted to have her, and we are using this webinar to continue the discussion. And so Patty will be presenting to us on advancing model development and discoverability through the National Library of Medicine. So I will pass it over to Patty. Thank you again, Patty, for, for your webinar. Thanks very much, Grace, and thank you for 10 years of colleagueship and a little bit more. We've done some reviews together and programs together. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and for those who are in the, in the U.S. and the East Coast time zone, we're almost in the middle of our afternoon. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to the IGMAG Multiscale Modeling Consortium. Um, you'll hear as I go through my, my remarks say why I believe modeling is an essential and, frankly, under-addressed component of the data science initiatives. But I want to back up for a few minutes and remind you why we're all here. We're here because of a belief that through data we will have better health care, better health for all, and it is the translation of data into health knowledge and health action that modeling affords. Now I'm going to be spending a little bit of time talking to you about the National Library of Medicine and where we see our role in this. Then I'm going to be talking about why I believe modeling is an important concept for libraries to be thinking about what we bring to the table, and then how do we go forward with creating a library of models or the proper set of library resources to assist your community. I'm looking forward to this conversation being highly interactive, and I'm looking forward to learning from you because as we are launching into our third century, we recognize at the National Library of Medicine that scientific communication is changing, and the library needs to keep abreast, maybe even slightly ahead of those changes. I also want to take a moment to introduce to you my colleague, Diane Babsky, who's off screen right now, but if you lean in, you'll get to see her, Diane. Uh, uh, you have to speak to make the camera turn to you. Um, Diane Babsky is the Deputy Director of our Library Operations here. Diane has uh, many, many important roles at the National Library of Medicine. She serves on the steering committee for the All of Us program. Some of you may be involved in that. That is the Precision Medicine Initiative. Diane also has major responsibilities for our National Network of Libraries of Medicine, which is a human network connecting around the country 6,500 points of presence that allow us to reach into every community. When we speak about modeling, we're often speaking to a professional scientific audience, but remember that at the far end of those models are people with health problems and health needs. So let's take a look at one of those to introduce this process. Library of Medicine that we support and extend and sometimes even drive the agenda of the National Institutes of Health. In this particular conversation, we're focusing on the use of analytical, simulation, quantitative, and structural models as a way of advancing discovery. By way of my direction for this session, I'm reflecting on the fact that investigators are developing new and quite sophisticated models to interrogate data sets. These models are costly to develop. They deserve the, to be reused. They require public exposure for rigor, reproducibility, and they also can be inspiring the next generation of analytics. But to characterize model providence and performance, we, re, we must put into place some tools that the library can bring forward that will enhance reusability and we hope advance the validation and identification of which, under which conditions models perform best. At the current time, we see a great deal of in linking between models and specific data sets, so we have almost a one-to-one -one mapping. I look forward to a time where models become a one-to-many mapping, a model used multiple times, and see that as a service the library should be fostering. In order to do that, we need to figure out how to first characterize models, secondly, define relevant metadata, and third, make models directly discoverable. 
I want to use our time today to talk about the tools we could put into place to be able to do these three characteristics, but also to make sure that we learn from you how do you see models becoming part of the substrate of discovery in the future. Now, in order to do that, you have to understand a little bit about the National Library of Medicine. So let me tell you and introduce you to us. Most of you probably know us through PubMed. Maybe you use dbGaP. Maybe you've been to one of our training programs or you've used some of our other resources like PubMed, PubMed Central or Medline Plus. We are a large institute here at NIH, about a half a billion dollar a year budget. That budget is spent in a lot of different ways, providing access to the literature worldwide, ensuring the safe storage of genomic information, making it possible to run analytics like BLAST to discover the alignment between different genome sequences. Uh, we have 1,700 women and men that work at the National Library of Medicine. We're different from the other institutes in that our, we are a, a human intensive institute. Most institutes, their budget is distributed out through the country to research teams around the country. At the N National Library of Medicine, 80% of our budget actually stays on campus, building the resources that enable discovery around the world. 700 of those staff work specifically within our NCBI. Our genomic databases are held in NCBI, and NCBI also provides the platform that enables access to the literature, that provides access to PubMed Central, and importantly, now provides the first place for data deposit along with articles so that investigator curated data sets can be made available with the articles that describe them. In addition to that, we have our primary bibliographic data set, which is PubMed. That gets about 4 million visitors every single day, and we've learned even over this holiday weekend that there is no holiday from health, and PubMed continues to be used over the 24-hour period all the time. We have about 5,000 visitors a day to our specialized data sets, to dbGaP, to GenBank, to some of our protein structural databases. And these specialized users come through a different interface. They help us understand how to label and curate the information thereafter. They are partners in the discovery process, as we hope the modeling and simulation community will become partners in the discovery process. Some of our resources, though, are not only used by researchers, but they're used in clinical practice. So our RxNorm resource, which is our, our listing of drug titles and special information about the medication, including the FDA-approved drug inserts, that, that resource is called on over a thousand times a minute by computer systems in hospitals around the country trying to ensure that medication lists are accurate or to conduct medication reconciliation. So some of our resources, although they're built by research, are actually more used in clinical practice. As I just mentioned earlier, we have a human network in addition to our electronic network. Our National Network of Libraries of Medicine is supported by eight regional centers around the country. And these networks are playing a very important role as we move into data-driven discovery because they are the connection between the academic health science libraries, the hospital libraries, and the public libraries. So as you think about our national network and you think about where your, your investigators can get assistance in their local areas, remember that through their academic health science library, they have access to specialized resources through the National Library of Medicine, and that is another pathway for them to interact with us. Our national network of libraries of medicine staff are being trained increasingly on how to become data sophisticated librarians, how to assist in uploading of data sets to public repositories, how to discover data sets for investigators, how to produce a data management plan for a research project. So the, the, the national network is not simply a way to make sure that our books are distributed widely, but also to make sure that the, the librarian support for data science exists around the country. We also provide training programs. We have both a T32 and a T15 training program. Our T15 training program focuses on biomedical informatics, and there are some training programs that focus specifically on the development of analytics and visualization tools, sometimes for general clinical practice, sometimes for biomedical or biological phenomenon, and sometimes for public health phenomenon. <coughs> Excuse me. In addition to that, we have a T32 program that is focused exclusively on data science training at the pre-doctoral and postdoctoral level, funded originally by the BD2K program. This is an area where analytics have also been developed, here more specifically around the analytics related to large data sets. 
The merging of informatics and data sets is an important conversation I'd like to be able to have later on now, but let me go on a little farther with where other things the library does that you might not know. Importantly, we provide disaster response information. We make sure that during a disaster such as Hurricane Harvey or the San Juan tragedy, that there are library resources continuously available as needed for researchers and for clinicians in the area, that there are safe ways to store data, and that there are pop-up libraries that allow citizens to have access to emergency response information. Now we are facing a significant challenge, as you can imagine, in Puerto Rico with the lack of electrical support without the internet. The National Library of Medicine's resources are hard to get at, so we're working to support our librarians in the Puerto Rico area to make sure that there is access to emergency information. We have a special relationship to, with the journals and the publishers that allows for open access from areas of disaster to the, the published literature for set periods of time after a disaster such as this. So although most of our resources are used on an everyday basis in pretty safe and stable conditions, every once in a while we have to step up to the more challenging conditions in the environment around us. We are mostly familiar with bringing together information and resources in what I would consider fairly familiar in traditional ways, bringing journals together, making sure genomic databases are available, capturing and supporting investigators as they talk to each other and have the products of their research available. But as we move into a data-driven future, we need to be able to think about how analytics and models become part of the scientific communication conversation. So I'd like to move now to my remarks about models and modeling and why we care about them. I come from an industrial engineering perspective. I was trained in as a decision analyst, so modeling is a part of my background. We are focused at the National Library of Medicine on modelings for three key reasons. First, we believe it will enhance the rigor of research, making models visible, understandable, able to be interrogated, is going to allow for increased uh, accuracy in the way the research is conducted. Secondly, we believe that better focus on models allows for reproducibility of both results as well as the predictability of finding the same results with new and similar uh, data sets. And third, we're focused on the models because not only is it important to document what was done, but to make available to others, to make the models reusable. And strategies to do that are popping up around the world anyway. We have GitHub, we have investigator-driven uh, libraries, we have shared code that gets passed around through email. So there already is a, a culture of reuse, but what a, when the library steps in, they step in when we can bring in specialized skills to ensure rigor in a more structured manner, to enhance reproducibility in a more efficient manner, and to encourage reuse in a more accessible manner. Now, why does the library care about models? We care about models for the five reasons that you see here on the left side of the screen. Because we can assist with characterization, because we have specialized skill in curation, because we create collections, because we want to be able to connect models and other relevant products of research, and because we have a mission to communicate. But fundamentally, the National Library of Medicine is also concerned about models because it is a research environment where we are investing in the development of new methodologies for interrogating large data sets, for understanding how to bring together heterogeneous data sets, and for developing new mechanisms of automated curation and strategies to discover data on the fly. Let me go through these in a little bit more detail now. First, let's talk about characterizing models. This is where your expertise, your understanding of the methodologies you work with, of the different d domains that you produce models for, are essential for us to better understand so we can learn from you what are the minimum data elements necessary to characterize a model. Is it model type, the purpose that the model was originally created for, what assumptions must be satisfied that, to make sure that that model is useful and usable, where has it been used, at what scale is it addressed. There may be many other minimum data elements that you say would be essential for you to either characterize the models you are building or to understand models that others have built. We're interested in characterization because this set of descriptors becomes important as we try to curate the models and later make them discoverable. 
Characterization of models is also important because it enhances model verification and model validation. It, model verification is the model implemented properly, and usually that's a software question. Model validation, does it match what's in the real world? Does it match what we expect based on our understanding of actual phenomenon, how the model predicts or explains what is occurring? Model characterization is the first step, and this is the closest step to the domain experts. You understand the phenomenon of your model best. What analytical tools are necessary? What kinds of assumptions about computation are important to put together? Once we get, go into the process of characterizing a specific model, and here I'm asking you to bear with me and think about model as a very general term that can mean everything from a simple algorithm to a large-scale software implementation. We'll come in a few minutes about describing in, in some more depth. The models that we produce are each require or can benefit by having a unique identifier. Having a unique ID on a scientific product is the starting point for making uh, any scientific product locatable, reusable, and, and able to be interrogated. So a unique ID must be, as it says, unique. And I'll come back why that's a challenge in a moment. I reviewed a paper this morning that identified in our own dbGaP system a particular uh, um, sequence that has 27 different unique IDs, each one providing a slightly different perspective on the very same phenomenon. Uniqueness must be a characteristic both of the entity that is being described as well as the way that entity is thought of in the scientific community that uses it. Second, unique IDs must be machine readable. It's not enough to have an ID that can be read by a human. Most of the use of, of identifying, locating, and frankly, integrating information right now occurs through computation. And <clears throat> alphanumeric characters are not sufficient. A machine-readable uh, unique ID must have a predictable sequence of, of segments and phrases, must be able to be accessed and read by a number of different programs, so it must meet certain standards. And it must be interpretable in, it, from its, by, by simply identifying and exploring the ID, not by needing to read through or work through the entire model. So you, uh, you, think of, you need to think of a unique ID as something that it will allow a machine to recognize that this is a simulation model, or this is a probabilistic model, or this is a bioinformatics se uh, pathway sequence. Um, unique IDs to be successful in a large and highly distributed knowledge environment have to be free to generate and access. And what that means is that it, there must be a low barrier to entry for the individual who creates the model, whether it's an algorithm or a piece of software or a pathway, there, there must be a simple way for that individual to be able to know how to label the model, to, to label the identity, identifier rather, and know how to access, to locate it, look for it later on, which, which, if we step down to the bottom, is where the public registration authorities come into play. Public registration authorities provide the tools that allow users to attach unique IDs to their model or to their entity. And one other aspect of unique IDs that make them the starting point of understanding the ecosystem of models is ensuring that there's consistent use across journals and publishers, and that requires uh, levels of agreement of community-based standards and also a significant amount of mapping of information from one type of data structure to another. I've identified here two of the most commonly used public registration authority for unique IDs related to models. That's the RRID managed by something called SciCrunch.org and the Digital Object Identifier or DOI.org. You can explore those individually in your own time, uh, but I, now I'd like to, to walk through them a little bit more and explain how we use them in curation. So curation is a process of formalizing the model identification and making it accessible to search engines, making it accessible to other research products for linking. And the two that I identified from the previous page that we're going to talk about in some depth are the resource identifiers, research resource IDs, which is RRID. Is. That was advanced by Force 11. It's specified at the model level, and it came out of a community that was concerned about identifying a wide range of research products from the genomic strain to the particular mouse that was used in an experiment. And they, they have a rather expensive view of, 
um, what the, the, the identification is able to provide. It is always investigator initiated, that is an individual investigator seeks uh, to label the, um, the entity that they're interested in, in describing and making discoverable. It is voluntary, there's no requirement that uh, our IDs be used. And it's, a, it's referred to as something we call an a priori assignment, that is it's assigned at the development of the model. A digital research identifier is slightly different. It has a formalized structure that begins with a kernel, and that allows for the, the, the first sequence of numbers in a digital research, digital object identifier, to, deter, to, to demonstrate what particular entity this, this DIY is referring to. It provides both the, the, the technical and social infrastructure for registering and use of interoperable identifiers, and that is what the, what a, the, the DOI.org provides. And it also serves as the formal registration authority for the ISO standard for the DOI system. So ISO provides a formalized formalization standard that's been agreed upon. Now, this, this can become increasingly esoteric, but bear with me for one more description about how we think of these in two slightly different ways. The RRID, which is being advanced quite extensively within the NIH community, characterizes the methods of research identifying things as I indicated, model organisms, cell lines, antibodies, and tools that you may have used. Um, they can also identify blogs, software to toolkits, and, um, and algorithm and implementation. So not simply the algorithm, but a place that it's been implemented. Um, generally, what happens is researchers include the RRID within the materials and methods section of a paper, or as you'll see in a few minutes, in the, the citation of the and the, the keyword citation part of the uh, PubMed, uh, PubMed um, insert for that article. The DOI, the Digital Object Identifier, actually characterizes objects. So these are now complete identifications. They're complete uh, uh, declarations, maybe a book, maybe an article, maybe, maybe a full software program. So there is some fuzziness between what constitutes a DOI and what's an RRID and which to use when. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the tradition for DOIs is long, longer in standing than the RRID. The, the challenge and the reason why the RRID emerged is because uh, investigators needed to go deeper than the article level to be able to make a declaration of methods that were important in their study. The primary purpose that I wanted to have this conversation with you is to talk about making, what it would mean to make a collection of models. What the collection of models looks like to a library means how do we bring together the right set of resources so that they can be investigated, interrogated, and used by others. It may be we need to bring computational tools. It may be mean we need to bring the English language explanation of a computation. It may mean to bring, we bring an executable file. But at the very minimum, we're already starting to create compilations or a library of models by integrating the use of DOIs and RRIDs within a PubMed, PubMed citation. So if you look at the screen here with me for a minute, I call your attention first to the box in the upper corner of the page. This is where the DOI of this particular article exists, uh, is, is reported. It is a permanent identifier for this, the final version of this particular article. And it, it, is, it supplants, it can supplant, but is, and, and is somewhat redundant with the actual journal citation, but if you'll notice from the DOI, it's a location finder, it's not an attribution. So it's not possible to tell anything about which journal this came from by simply looking at the DOI. Under this, you see a typical structure of a, PubMed entry, of a PubMed entry. There's a title, there's a list of authors, there's author information, and there's an abstract. But then drop down to the bottom or to the keyword section. And in the keyword section here, you see the use of several RRIDs. You see how they're denoted in the article, the RRID in a particular sequence. That sequence would be assigned through the use of the SciCrunch site, and it would be registered in the SciCrunch site. An individual or any, any group of people who are using the same set of research resources would be using the same RRID in their studies, thus allowing for easy linking across studies by searching not on the topic of the study, but on the part and parcels of the methods in the study. 
The last two aspects that the National Library of Medicine is concerned about with models have to do with collecting, connecting and communicating. It's our vision that the library of the future is going to be a sphere of discovery that connects literature, study data, models to use the study data, pathways, people, funding, protocols, etc. Each of these ovals in its own right is, to, is being expanded with better development of how to formally represent the content underlying this. So, for example, many of you probably are using ORCID ID right now as a person identifier. And, and the National Institutes of Health will be uh, in the next year or so making a better integration between the ORCID ID and your ERA ID. We're looking for using as, many pos as much as possible standards to make this available. We are building libraries of instruments through the Common Data Repository. Our Common Data Repository has an, a, 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 a set of instruments that, all, that measure multiple instruments that measure the same phenomenon. So investigators who claim to be using those instruments have a an reference point. We envision, though, the importance of collecting models as being as a unique phenomenon it's something that is particularly germane to this, this community. We want to understand from you, how can we better make a library of models or a way to collect models in addition to embedding them in literature citations so they become useful to the modeling community? Finally, the library has a responsibility to communicate about models. And so we are driven by, first and foremost, the NIH policies and guidelines on rigor, reproducibility, and transparency of research. Something is released on these every couple of years, and we make sure our library resources are aligned with them. But we also recognize the increasingly dominant model of interacting with the literature through automated agents. That is, we're not reading every single paper to determine whether or not it's relevant, but we're using links such as RRIDs or DOIs to bring sets of papers together to allow us to sit, have assistance, cognitive assistance with synthesizing the literature. And overall, we envision a future where literature synthesis is going to rely heavily on universal machine access to key entities. We've done a reasonably good job with the factual text entities by having terminology models and that represent that. We're now moving to tools that allow us to better characterize the models and the images within articles so we can begin to search directly and link directly to the relevant components of articles. We, as the NIH, are hopeful to support model declaration through our guidelines, particularly the guidelines for rigor and transparency for all awards that started in 2016. That's a way of determining, uh, defining the, the specific research products that are being used in a process. We are also advancing strategies on validation, verification, and version control. We would be disseminating best practices, particularly best practices of um, how to, to, code, to characterize models and how to assign the RRIDs to them. So and I'm, I'm noticing some questions coming through about specific standardization of languages of even describing models. This idea of providing a, a reference point for best practices around model declaration and verification is a reasonable use of a library. And finally, and importantly for our accountability to the public, we want to be able to be sure that we have we are able to trace the contributions of research. I'm going to leave you now with my page of questions for you, which include the following. What does a model look like, a model of libraries look like, uh, who would use it, how does it differ from the model description in articles, how is authority imbued? And that, that is to asking you to think about what is the equivalent for models that a review board or an editor, editor is for a journal article? Should models be stored separate from the data they are used on and the reports they are used for, or should they be stored only integrated with them? And finally, how can the National Library of Medicine help to advance multi-scale modeling? I'm going to close with letting you know how you can reach me, and then we'll go back to that list of questions. I write a weekly blog and musings on the mezzanine, and I invite you, if you're so interested, to contribute a blog. We have guest bloggers that bring forward their ideas of interest, and this would be an excellent place to hear more about models and how the library can support you. You can also follow me on Twitter or reach me through the, uh, the email you see here on the screen. And now I'll go back to our questions for time for conversation and answers. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Patty. That was fantastic. 
So we have um, several people with questions on the chat. Um, and I think we, we can start maybe with those questions and then we can go to Patty's questions. Is that okay? That sounds fine with me. So, um, Zen Lee, did you want to voice your question? You have to unmute yourself first. Okay, if you're having trouble unmuting, I'll, I'll ask the question. So I guess the question is, what is the role of machine learning in model discovery? Wow, <laughs> that's huge. Um, so uh, I would imagine um, that it would be best answered by a person whose skill set is in machine learning. But if you're talking about machine learning as a search strategy, so what can we learn about the location or the patterns or the commonly occurring um, if you will, related activities around models. I think machine learning could help us discover the location of models that are yet undocumented or are not documented separate from the articles that they're written in. Machine learning can allow us to locate features of an article and then extract the set of articles so that a human curator can begin to do interpretations on that. Um, I also believe that we're, we're interested quite in the, in the idea of looking at models outside of the healthcare environment. So one of the, the very important aspects that I think machine learning can do is to assist with, do, with domain independent searching, where clusters of uh, performance, and, and now I'm thinking, again, matched against the literature, but in the future matched against um, analytic tools or even um, uh, video descriptions might be able to discover uh, both similarities in the way, uh, way models are described as well as the ways that they're applied. And I would be really open to hearing from anyone in the audience who's got something to add to that. Okay. All right, next up, um, John Gennari, did you want to uh, voice your question to Patty? Sure. Hey, John. Work? We We can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, yeah, so as you can see, I, I asked um, your slides, you said something in, uh, verbally, but your slides didn't actually have anything about standardization of how a model is written. And I think that's a very crucial part of the metadata or standardizing languages. And I would say the field is in kind of a sorry state where, I mean, an understandably sorry, so, sorry state, where the majority of models are coded in, in ad hoc MATLAB or C or other languages versus the use of a more formal declarative language like SPML or CellML. Um, and so one thing I would love to see is more movement or more ideas for how to encourage more modelers to use those kinds of standards. Um, do, you have any, do you have ideas about incentives? I think it's a great point. And let me, let me first slightly defend myself by saying the reason why I didn't comment on it is to me, this is a domain skill set, but the library can assist you in it. But how do you think we might be assisting in it? Yeah, well, I think the word incentive is a good one. Um, and so I think, I think we can make this all, all work together. If we have a really good library that's really usable of these models, and we only allow people to go into the library if they have some sort of formalization of the language they use, then that becomes a, an incentive right there. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. So we, we can, we're able to uh, govern that a little bit with the literature, but it's through the publishers. So the publishers say, we expect an article to have an abstract, a background, a significance, et cetera, et cetera. We, the NIH has some control over that by, by requiring declarations in certain structures in the proposals and in the, the RPRR. So one way to think about this is, is, is requiring reports in a formalized structure. That's nice. um, I don't know if we can actually do that, but it's certainly something that we can explore. explore. Um, I, I, this gets a little bit to the idea of, of who's the head nurse of the model. So if, if we're going to create a library of models, um, I, not everyone in the, in the group may know I'm a nurse. John knows I'm a nurse. Um, and, and so it's, it's a useful, it's a useful uh, model, if you will, to think about so there's someone in charge like a head nurse. And having been a head nurse, I can tell you you're not nearly as in charge as you need to be. 
So we're not going to have that kind of governance coming through the door. And it's a really important uh, uh, value in a library that we, um, we collect and, um, uh, and, and disseminate information that meets a, a minimum standard of scientific uh, accountability. And beyond that, we, 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 re we recognize the importance and, the, frankly, the rights of the domain experts to determine the quality. So we are, uh, and I'm looking at Diane to say, please get me out of this. We provide, we provide guidance around this, the basic structure of how things should be reported. We don't determine the content of what is reported. Is that right. fair? Yes. So, so certainly with what you're suggesting, John, if we're going to create a model of libraries, we have the ability to say, and the model must be expressed this way. And whether or not the model itself is correct is not, it's not something we can determine. Right. But we can, we can certainly, I mean, does that make sense that we could actually say to deposit a model here, it's got to be in this kind of a structure? Yeah. We require, for example, papers that come into PubMed Central have to be in an XML format. Right. So we can require some formatting structure. But that still doesn't necessarily address what you're asking, which is the, the, the expression of the model. So we can say, could we say it's acceptable in a certain... Um, well, if, if you demand, model? yeah, I mean, if you demand that it's XML, uh, that would be part of it. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's really an open-ended question. And I think it also depends on the community of modelers as well. If, if, uh, if uh, I mean, probably other people on the call would be better suited to than me to answer. But you know, to what extent is MATLAB? I've heard that that language used the most. To what extent is MATLAB really the majority of models that are out there? I don't know. I mean, there's really a wide variety of models. And if you want to be a big umbrella, you're probably not going to be able to allow just one format. You're going to have to allow multiple formats. Because no one language is suitable for all kinds of models. Yes, yes, I think that's true. And there's, there's been some comments about that on the, um, the, uh, the, the chat about the need for plurality and not sufficient, not individual standards. Let me go back to Grace and ask her to get us to a new, uh, uh, another question or else John and I will go into one of our personal chats for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like on the chat, people are chatting among themselves, too. So I, I hope hopefully your IT folks will be able to preserve the chat because people are sending in links as well to maybe help answer some of your questions. So I guess in a way, John's question sort of is, uh, is addressing your first question in terms of what the library of models would look like um, and possibly the types of curation that would occur. Um, so I guess then the, the next question, we could go to your question, who, who would use it? And uh, I guess we'll open it up for all your questions. How does it d differ from model descriptions and articles? How is authority imbued? So I'd like to open that up. Um, unless somebody on the chat would like to voice your questions, you're welcome to do that um, since we have so many discussions going now. I, it's, I think this is a great outcome, by the way, if you're talking among yourself. Um, and so it, let, me, let me summarize a couple things that I'm seeing if you're not all seeing them. There's a, somebody said it's too early to require XML for everybody, and we don't want to prematurely close off innovation by requiring a single format. That's certainly very, very true. Um, and at the same time, um, the, the, there is a need to be able to, uh, to make resources more uh, accessible. So one of the challenges I'm going to open to this community is for those of you who deposit articles into PubMed Central, you're able to attach um, supplementary files to your PubMed article. You could attach your model, and that could be a testing ground for us to begin to look at what kinds of ways are people declaring models. It certainly is acceptable to, to, to think about pointing to a GitHub uh, address or to um, back to your own institute, but one of the advantages of putting the model and the data and the article in one place is that you can, others can actually run it. And I sort of slipped that in, but let me remind all of you that as of the 1st of November, PubMed Central will accept two gigabyte data files with a put submission to, for a PubMed Central article, so you're able to deposit data along with your uh, articles. Now, I recognize for some of you, two gigabyte is like a blink. 
So I mean, we're, but we can't take those whole human reads yet. That's great. Now someone has so asked about. That, go ahead, Grace. Go. No, I, was, I liked your slide where you showed the little the world in terms of your digital research objects and linking instruments, models, study data, and all sorts of things. Um, I, I think I'd, it'd be it'd be great if you could also include failed studies as well uh, and legacy data and benchmark models and benchmark data. How 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 do you um, envision connecting it all? I guess it's through all these identifiers that you're saying that people would be able to link from each component to the other? At, at this point in time, we, we are envisioning that metadata and curation uh, pathways provide the tools that allow these linkages to be made in a fairly stable way. I know there's a, uh, a varying size community of people who say, don't worry about any of that, we can just run a good machine learning program over it and we'll get everything we need. And it's possible that we will get everything we need that way. In the short run, we believe that um, the structure of knowledge in domains is built through uh, terms and the terms and the labels become a very important way of representing knowledge. As we go into a future of data-driven discovery, I can envision curation on use of a model or a data set in addition to curation on, on deposit. But for right now, I think we're really at the curation on deposit or the curation on generating end. Okay. So I, I feel like a teacher talking to people talking in the classroom. If you guys want to bring your conversations <laughs> <laughs> out loud, that would be great. Um, I think Herbert was talking to Jonathan. Did you guys want to voice any of your discussions? So you, Herb and I... Sure you don't... Yeah, okay. go ahead. We can hear you. And that's one of the big uh, bottlenecks in in model uh, in model publication. Um, I mean, Europe has a large group that curates models at the EBI. I mean, is this something that the NLM could help with by setting up a team to curate models? Because otherwise, you'll just get rubbish going into your into your library. So. Um Yes, and maybe, and sure. Um, so the, <laughs> we could set up a group to curate models. We actually use a balance of human and uh, machine curation right now with the literature. And what's important there is that our, our, our human curators are many times subject matter experts, so they understand nuances in a field, and they're able to go beyond and, and automatically assign keywords to, to get the gist of a study, if you will. Yeah. Um, at the same time, they do not evaluate the quality of the science. And so one of the things that I, I'd be curious, and I think it was Jonathan who was speaking um, about the EBI experience, do they actually put a quality imprimatur on the, the models? No. They, they, they don't judge the science at all. They just make sure the model works and it's been um, appropriate metadata has been added to the model. So do, do people submit test data with the model? Well, they're just trying to recreate what the published paper claimed. Mm -hmm. So which, you know, is good enough because that, that's what was published. With the data set from the paper? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, I, you know, this part of this conversation is to, is to have us to begin to think about what would it take for us to do this? And it sounds like one of the things that actually would take the place of an editorial board or editorial review. Is this, um, I'm a little loath to call it curation because that means so many different things to different people, right. but it would yeah. be this filter that, that, yeah. that tests, does the model pass a minimum test? Right. Is it executable? Right. Does it deliver what it, it said here? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that will be, you know, that's worth thinking about. That'll be I, good. I good. No, that'd be a great step forward. Yeah. Um, what, um, what, to what extent would it be useful to have um, a function similar to what we have with preprints, where individuals are able to comment on and modify models? 
So we have a reference model, but if someone says, you know, this didn't work with this unless I started it with it from this point in the, in the process, or I had to add these two routines in? I think in theory it sounds great, but in practice I doubt anybody would do it because if you look at the comment, the comment sections in most journals, I nobody comments. We have so not people that comment on PubMed comments right now. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, right. 50, 50. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it would be nice in theory, but I don't know how it would it would pan out in practice. You'd have to try it out, I guess. Um, so I would like to ask this community, from the looks of the comments, some of you do work in, with biological phenomenon. Um, to what extent are there are there tools now that, that document the pathway of an experiment that could be expanded to also document the, the analytic or modeling tools that go along with it? Are you aware of any? Um, Can well, you I mean, repeat I the question? Do you want me to, did you say repeat the question? Yes. So I, I, I know we're, we're seeing an increasing number of tools that document this, the workflow of an of a experiment, so yeah. the procedure itself gets documented. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very intrigued by how Jupyter Notebooks are becoming really robust tools for uh, if you will, real-time capture of what's actually going right. on. We're almost up to self-documenting code, I guess, but not quite. So with respect to models, are there, are there similar tools being built in the modeling environment that we should be thinking about as adjuncts? Yeah, there, there are. There are. Um, there's the simulation experiment des description markup language. Um, I mean, your point about Jupyter is, is interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've thought about that as well, but we'd, we'd prefer a non-specific language to handle the description of the computational experiment. So SETML is a sort of community agreed format for describing an experiment. I mean, it's still, it's still being developed. Whereas if you went to Jupyter, you might be stuck with Python or R or something, um, and everybody start having think. language wars about what's better. Um, so with, with something like SETML, you could convert it to Python. And in fact, this is something we do. And we have a Jupyter Notebook, which we, and that's what we do, actually. And so when you download a, a model which has an experiment attached to it, it gets translated to, into Python. And you see it there in terms of Python, then. And then you can mess with it, you know. Uh, so yeah, there, there are efforts underway to do that. Do you see the, the library from our research investments being able to, to stimulate growth in this area, or is it mature enough already that we don't need to do any more investment? Well, I, from my perspective, I, I agree with Herbert that simulations, to some extent, uh, that there is tools for reproducing simulations. Uh, that said, I don't think there's nearly enough tools for reproducing the models themselves. Correct. Uh, I think there's there's typically very little information that's published about where a model comes from. Uh, so specific data sources, for example, or specific assumptions that were made in the model construction process. Yeah. All of that information is typically lost. Uh, there's almost there's just a very little high level information, or sometimes it's present in supplementary materials. But so I think that's a big area where. It's Don't you think in programs like BioPsych that was the intent? I think those are pretty reproducible, and and whenever it's um, annotated, it, it's usually well annotated as far as why something was added. Well, but BioPsych isn't a model. So on Metaflux, there's Peter Karp's group has some attempt to uh, build models from BioPsych, and and my group has. I, I, it starts to pursue really similar is, things. The model of metabolism, but it's not a simulation model. Yeah, sure. It's a representation. But I would say that the vast majority of models that are published, certainly a, right. at least the vast majority of simulation models, don't use the kind of practices that Peter Karp's group does with biopsych. Yeah. I think, I think that's the key point to communicate to Patty is that there is actually a huge opportunity for improvement here. We are nowhere near mature. We would use lots of help about curation and standards, and so we welcome this uh, interest from the NRM. So thanks, John. 
I saw a comment earlier that, that I want to ask somebody to expand on, which had to do with um, we should uh, curate models. Uh, models should only be stored with the art, with an article. So you, you don't see this particular commentator was saying that there really is, is no need and perhaps not, it's not desirable to just to have a, a curation of, of models that might point out to places they were used but not necessarily be tightly connected to them. Yeah, I mean, this is what Biomodels does. I mean, all the models there link to, there's metadata that links them to the original article. So it works quite well to separate the models from the article. So long as Biomodels doesn't go down, of course, and then you're in trouble. So that's the value but, of the federal operation, maybe. Um, let me ask you this, though. So that in your community, then, it would not be appropriate to publish an article, publish a model alone. You'd have to have an article that documented or demonstrated the performance or gave, gave the yeah. history. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. No. Well, no. No, uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, the reason there, we currently require a publication is because if you look at the model, you cannot figure out what's in it. Okay. The model is just a bunch of code with a bunch of math in it, and there's no biology in many descriptors. So there has to be a paper associated with it that tells you that variable X is estrogen receptor and variable Y is progesterone receptor. So uh, the, the fact that we cannot oh, I describe see. a model. I see. I see. Yeah, but that, so, but that, that could be changed by having the metadata in the model. I don't, I don't know if that's a good example, though. What you, I mean, what you need is why was the model built, what questions were, were asked of the model, and what were the answers? Yeah, but that can all be put in the, in the model itself if you structure the model properly. But you cannot put in the model assumptions in the model itself. That is yeah, no, no, you, you can't, no, of course you can. Your, your model is the assumptions. If your model includes estrogen receptor, then your model includes estrogen receptor. If it does not include progesterone receptor, then your model does not include progesterone receptor. Those are your assumptions. Yeah, but you have to know why, though. I'm going to take the prerogative of the presenter for the last two minutes, if I can. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I want to thank all of you for your for your um, uh, participation. This has been a, truly a delight for me. I feel I, I just feel like I'm reconnecting with my roots. But I have been asked several times about, please tell us about clinical trials and what's going on with clinicaltrials.gov and let us know what's going on here. So um, let, me, let me take a minute to do that. First of all, I, I thank those of you who've made use of clinicaltrials.gov. It's an outstanding resource. What, became, what came out of a research project in the late 90s has turned into be an international resource collecting over 250,000 studies from around the world. Um, and now has a couple of features that I think will be of particular interest to this um, this community. Can I ask who's ever typing to mute, please? Oh, sorry, um, it was. Oh, fine. Not sorry. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, we we now are you are, we are now have the capability of receiving the statistical analysis plan deposited with the clinicaltrials.gov re, uh, registration. So that uh, that. Uh, the, the trial registration includes an explicit description of clinical trials. I'm sorry, of the analytical plan used for that clinical trial. Secondly, we now have the capability of accepting uh, human subject consent form as part of the trial declaration. So this is allowing us to um, make sure we understand the, the, the privileging related to the data that are available. We are collecting and, and in many cases requiring deposit of results uh, within one year of the completion of a study, there's about 35 or 40,000 studies now that have the results of the primary outcomes. We anticipate that those results will, in the, in the relatively near future, be described at the level of uh, gender and race where relevant, so we can, be, we can do better subgroup um, understanding of representation in clinical trials. And um, finally, we are, we, the, the, tri, the whole trial database is completely downloadable uh, through an API, and so it, it is ripe for the kinds of studies that someone had asked earlier about analytics and, um, re, and other applications of the database itself. We are uh, making um, <coughs> uh, continued work with the interface. We've heard it's a little bit clunky. Some people don't like the uploads of the data sets, and some people have find that uh, there is some concern that's been raised in the literature that people have found studies declared in clinicaltrials.gov that is registered there 
that have been um, at, at best suspect and, and somewhat risky for patients. So we are in the process of working with our Office of General Counsel to um, be to make to be able to be clear that we, when we provide information about studies, what the public can and can't uh, uh, trust about what's been presented there. Uh, we don't want in any way imply that a study has been evaluated at the NIH just because it's on the clinicaltrials.gov website. At the same time, we recognize the importance of the scientific community of having a very wide range of all the clinical trials in the world recorded. And that brings us to 2.30, so I'm going to have to close off my portion of this. It looks like you all could keep um, talking away for a while. I'm glad that uh, I had the opportunity to get to know you this way. Please feel free to contact me in the future if there's things that I can do or you believe the NLM could do for the modeling community. We will be following up with Grace about the next steps in our planning. I don't envision the library will be available within the next six months, but I do see a future where a library of models complements the literature. Finally, I'm going to close by asking you to remember you can deposit and link to your models through the full text papers in clinical trial, sorry, in, in PubMed Central, and I hope you'll continue to do that. Thanks very much, and thank you, Grace, for this opportunity. So, Patty, on behalf of IMAG and everyone in the consortium, we thank you for this webinar, and we usually give a virtual applause to our speakers. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And, Best wishes for the um, holidays to everyone. Thank you. And Patty says that we can post her uh, slides on our wiki, so you'll see that on, next to her entry on the webinar and the wiki. And so if people want to be added to the list who aren't on the list, just send me an email. I'm grace.pang at nih.gov. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.